So with um, this whole Andrew Tate movement, I will say that he has massively inspired me and a lot of my group of friends. Yeah. Who, wants, who really wants to see their wife getting clarted by a next man? Or who wants to see their wife just, do you know what I mean? And having that footage out there forever, that's crazy. And I told my girlfriend at the time and she told me to be realistic and it's not an option and blah, blah, blah. Like if I'm with someone, yeah, she's mine and I'm hers and we're an extension of each other. She belongs to me, I belong to her. How I stopped getting distracted by females, if I'm completely honest, it was um, through therapy. Um, and basically there was just one lady out of all the people that I came in contact with on my, along my journeys, this one older lady that just cut through all of my cheeky, like happy, that like, bullshit stuff. And then she was just like, Hello and welcome to another episode of Insight with the Podcast Club. Can you tell me who you are, where you're from and what you do, please? All right, so my name is Sean Paleo. I'm from Cornwall originally, but I live in Birmingham now. And I'm a model and actor and influencer. Okay, cool. Just before we get into your success and everything you've achieved, I want to go back a little bit and talk about life growing up for you, where you grew up and how you found things. Okay, so I've got like a super unique um, perspective and childhood, really. So obviously Cornwall's like a super white area. It's like 99% white, especially growing up. Um, and me being like Filipino, like you're always like an outsider. Like you, I wouldn't be classed as like an English person or like a whatever. They would just see me as Filipino. And obviously I came from like a really poor background. So like obviously my mum's an immigrant, my dad's on benefits. We grew up in the tiniest flat, like a super tiny flat. Um just broke, but not in a bad way, not in like a sub story way. Like I had food on my table, um, had opportunities so I was an athlete. I didn't have to miss out on much because of that. Because obviously because of my sport and I, I didn't have to miss out on um, opportunities and stuff. So that was cool. But it gave me a very unique perspective on stuff. And obviously when you're, when you're that, like when you grow up broke and poor, you don't really know it because you're just a child that wants to play sports. It's a, it's, a, it's a mad one. And then obviously being Filipino, I would spend two months of the year in the Philippines um, where the pound goes a lot further. So we'd, we'd, we'd experience like a life of someone higher up. But again, when I'm out there, because of my build and my physique and my facial structure and stuff, they could tell I wasn't full Filipino. So again, they'll see me as someone that's English. Um, and it just gave me like a super unique perspective because I was always an outsider, but I thrived in it. So, yeah. Okay, cool. So um, was going to the Philippines for them a couple of months as, as a child, was that like the highlight of your year? Was that like the family holiday? Yeah, so it was like, it was weird. I didn't know anything. I didn't know anything about that because we'd been doing it since I was a kid, and we stopped doing it when my older brother turned sixteen. So from zero to thirteen, it was just a part of life. Like you know, like brushing your teeth for Christmas, whatever. Like it just we went out there, and it was it was strange, man. So I remember like one time I never spoke about this before, but I came back to England. I remember in primary school so clearly, and I felt like I sat in my classroom and just started crying. I didn't I didn't know why, and then when the teachers asked me, I was just like I fell over. But I think it's just because, um, you know, like you're not used to being somewhere. It's like you feel like you should belong somewhere else. Or like, um, it's strange. It's hard to, it's like, it's very hard to pin down the exact emotion that it was. But I feel like this is why someone with mixed heritage, especially, it's so important to know your roots on each side. So I'm, I'm so blessed and lucky that my mum made sure that we grew up in a Filipino household where it's like we embraced our culture and food and the way we treat people and each other and the family and everything like that. So, yeah, man. That's a very unique place to be from in yeah. the UK. Um, how was school? School was nice. I liked school, you know. Because, again, I've just been an athlete and I love sport and I love competing. And I've always seen, like, being out... Because of stuff happening in my home, I always wanted to be outside my home. Um, and just getting to school, playing football, break time, lunchtime. And in primary school, like, you know, sports stage win everything. And then secondary school, played football first. And I was, I was talented at football. And then started playing basketball and... It's just cool, like I've, I've really thrived and obviously I've, um, I've always been alright with girls and stuff so we, we, yeah it was good, it was a good time man, just being good at sports and getting girls, it's, it's, it's okay in that environment. After school, uh, did you go to college or university or anything like that? So I went to, I, was, I went to college when I was 17 and that was when I first experienced living in a house because um, my mum and my dad broke up at that point and my mum moved into a house with someone else and I remember 17 yeah moving to a house and it was in a different area and we had stairs and like a separate room that was a kitchen. Um, had my own bedroom. Had like, cause I was so used to if I, even if you want to speak to a girl on the phone back where I grew up, we'd have to like stand outside just to get a bit of privacy because anywhere in the flat everyone can hear you. So like when I got to my mom's house, I remember like being able to speak to girls on the phone upstairs and downstairs and just it was mad just having a separate room for stuff. Um, 
Yeah, I went to college, smashed that with my basketball team. I had like a brotherhood that we grew up together, like my same team since under 14 or something. And we all went to college together. All like, it was such a tight, tight brotherhood. Um, yeah, and then after that, I went to university. And, and going to uni was never the plan for me. Um, it was always just to play basketball. That was, I, if you would have asked me at any point in my life, from when I was like 13 onwards, what are you going to do? I'd be like basketball player, basketball player. So I'd do whatever it takes to get there. So I just finished college. I typed into Google, um, number one basketball university. And then there's a thing called Bucks, which is like the British basketball, blah, 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 for universities. And Worcester won it eight years back to back. So I was like, that's where I'm going. So I just went there. And then... As simple as that? Just Yeah, just went there, applied for it, and I just went there. Um, and... For me, that that was like a bit of a culture shock, you know, because like growing up, yeah, I was always the only one. I listened to hip hop and I um hip hop and rap and shit because my brother, my older brother, had all the CDs of like the old school artists, so it influenced the way that I would um carry myself um and my work ethic and things like that. And then when I got to university, like obviously basketball is like a predominantly black sport, so like all of a sudden. I'm in. I'm indulged in this culture with these other guys, and all of my friends are now black, and they can all like run just as fast as me. They can all jump just as high as me. Listen to the same music as me. We dress the same, and it was like finding like a identity within a group of people that accepted me, and it was just like I felt normal. And then within work ethic and stuff, like I was used to being the only one that was always like willing to bleed and die for it at any point, shooting practice multiple times a week, and I just practice with different teams um, just because I'd, I'd want to train so much. And then when I got to uni, I'm, I'm around these other people that are just as like hungry for it as me and they come from similar backgrounds. And it's just like, it was like finding a home. I can't express it. And I was just like, you look around, I'm not, I'm not a minority anymore. Like everyone's brown or black or white. It's just like, it's not all just white. And it was like, you just felt at home, man. It felt, it felt so good. And then, yeah. And then they just seen, I feel like this is touching on girls again, but like but prior to that, I was, I, was, I was always like a bit of a player or whatever when I was younger. But prior to going to university, it's when like the man them see me and how girls reacted to me. And they were like, hey fam, what, are you not going to do this? And that? and that kind of influenced me a lot. And then that's how I kind of embarked on becoming um, a bit of a fuckboy back then with girls. Because of that reason, man. Because they were like, yeah, you can get all these girls, you might as well. And then your whole perception of it changes and shifts. So talk to me about uh, getting into modelling. So if we're talking about girls, yeah. we can tell that you do well. Yeah. So uh, how did the modelling career start? So the modelling career started after... Um, when I first moved to Birmingham after my basketball career, um, I was working in a school and I had a girlfriend at the time of four years and we'd, we moved in together and we had a really regular life. Like I moved into an apartment with her, normal job, eight till four, car outside. And I did like half a semester, was that six weeks or something, in a school, in a primary school in Smevik. And I was just like, yo, this life is not for me. And then me and her used to watch X on the Beach, back when it used to be like popping and people used to watch it. Um, and I'll see the people on it. And there was one guy in particular that was like um, mixed heritage, tattoos, spoke with a bit of slang. And I was like, wait, what? I didn't know that, that we could do this as well. I thought this was for like certain type of people. And then I seen another guy that had a similar physique to me. And I was like, wait. And my friends would text me like, bro, that guy's the same body as you, you know, like this and that. And I'm like, yeah, man. And I, I, at that point, I'd already like, super extroverted whatever room I went into I was super confident and stuff and all that stuff and I was like I could do this so I just literally said I was going to do it and then I just got grafting and I would like just google shit I just I don't I don't know what I was doing it because I was like at that time I had no one around me doing it and it wasn't really like a big thing so I was like yeah let me let me figure this out and I told my girlfriend at the time and she told me to be realistic and it's not an option and blah 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 and then I got offered a really good job bro well back home in Cornwall um, where I would have been on a good salary, I would have got my qualified teaching status and I would have been comfortable when your salary goes up each year at that point. But I was like, I sat down with the head teacher who everyone wants to get this one role. Like it's a, it's a high demand role to get because normally to get your QTS, you don't get put on a salary at the same time. But they were like, he sat down with me, waited for me to come back and I just like, I just said to him, I told him, I'm, I'm, I'm going to pursue this modelling thing. I want to pursue the social media thing, blah, blah, blah. And I left that room and then the guy I looked up to my whole life, um, I told him, he was like my mentor, and he laughed in my face, and he was like, okay, you're going to just... And then, you know, like, word of mouth, everyone was like, oh, so Sean's going to try and do this fitness thing on YouTube. Like, that kind of just changed the whole thing I was trying to do anyway. I wasn't even trying to do that, but they just, you know, through Chinese whispers, whatever, it all changed. And then, yeah, that was mad. So everyone told me to be realistic, and they didn't realise who they were speaking to, and they just put that fire and underneath me, and I just wrote all my goals down. 
um, that I want to do. And it would just be unrealistic stuff. Like, I'd be sit, it'd be standing in Birmingham before I ever did a photo shoot, looking at a billboard and being like, yeah, one day I'm going to be on this billboard. I'm not going to stop. One day I'm going to be shops in London. One day I'm going to be internationally published. One day I'm going to be this and that. And wrote it all down. I did it um, long term, short term, broke the goals down. Um, and then I just worked at it every single day. And there were so many hardships along the way. Um, and I, I held down a normal job for like two and a bit years whilst I was pursuing it. And when I was pursuing it, I would do stuff like, I would set my kids' work and I'd, I'd just go on my phone and have a criteria. I've got to mess 20, 20 brands, 20 managers, 20 agencies. And just get like, I'll get like 95% of people saying no. Then one person might give me a chance to be in a music video. One person might give me a chance to do a shoot for them for free. People don't understand, I did the first like, few, first few years, I didn't really earn anything. And then I thought joining the agency, getting with this top agency would be like a, like a, a breakthrough for me but turns out that wasn't the case. And then I thought this reality show that I did was going to get me the blue tick and was going to get me this so I can charge X amount. That wasn't the case. Get sold so many dreams, lied to all the time, but I just kept a clean heart and I kept grafting. Like no one can question my work rate. Like no, like everyone knows that, that some people would think, boom, I've, I've been working all day, I come to a podcast and then later on, the, the thought of like a, a, a casting tomorrow morning at 7 a.m. It's unrealistic to get there that now, bro. Like I would, I would drive there tonight and just leave my car outside ready just to get, just for a chance, like a one in a thousand chance I might get a role regularly. And I'll do that. And all the bangers I was driving to all these shoots, like, man, I'd like, for anyone that follows me for a while, you remember like what it was like, I had to drive with a coat inside my car because I had a leaking sunroof. I had no heating for like four years and all the bangers that I was driving. I didn't have, I'd pull up to shoots in like one of my old courses that didn't have anything. And then, I'd have to just like park it around the corner and then go stand in front of a Lamborghini. And then I had this one shoot that just kind of changed my whole life um, four years into my journey. And I haven't looked back since. I think um, a lot of the time, it only takes that one chance. That one chance, And bro. I think people don't understand that before you became who you are now, there was a lot of work, a lot of sacrifice and uh, a lot of things going on. What were some of the sacrifices that you had to go through to become the man you are today? Um, there's a lot, you know. So I think it's more in regards to, like, you know, like, missing stuff. So, like, missing friends, like, weddings, missing friends, parties and stuff like that. And But so that would be one, like, one factor of it. But I think it's the sacrifice of, it's more, it's, more, it's not so much the sacrifice, it's more the telling people around you that you're going to do something and for no one to believe in you. And, to like run off your own energy. I've heard it a lot in the podcast business tour recently, but like running off your own energy for all them years and convincing, like I have to convince my mum, like mum, like trust me, I know I haven't got any money right now, but I promise you just like, just, but you can't even give a time frame. I'm like, I promise you it's going to change. I, I, I will, like I will, this and that. And then it's just a constant graft, like, and it's tiring and it's just the energy and like the lack of sleep. And like, I didn't sleep for them four years, bro. Like for them four years prior to that, that big break I had, um, it was just graph 24-7. Can we talk about that big break? Yeah, bro, it was sick, man. So it was, um, it was, I basically got booked for a shoot in Amsterdam. Um, and even then, bro, like the, the lifestyle was just different. When you get that high level, that like, man, I, I went there, yeah, then like, as soon as you land, they give you like a catalogue of girls on your phone, like how many girls do you want to your room? And I'm just like, wait, what are these, what are these people are living like? But like, and obviously I don't do any drugs or anything, so actually maybe not mention this bit, but yeah, like, they just anything you want, they'll 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 give you and things like that, and you get treated differently. And then coming back from that, I was just like, yeah, marketing is so key in this in life. Marketing is something I fell in love with. So I was like, let me archive every small brand of my page that I've shot for previously. So I look I look a certain way. So when people first come across me, they only get one first impression. They're like, boom, well, oh, right, this guy shoots for X, Y, and Z. He must be so. So I've got rid of all of them. Now I'm in Amsterdam and I'm at this big shoot. I got back from there. And this massive brand hit me up and they were like, you're right, Sean, like, we'd um, love to book you. Um, can we inquire what your day rate is? And I never said a rate this high before because I would have done it for free to be associated with the name of this brand. But in my head after, I was like, I have to value myself, marketing, blah, blah, blah. So I said this price and threw my phone to the edge of my bed and I was like, oh, come on. And then my housemate checked it and it was like, yeah, what time do you want your flight and hotel? And I got there and like, I agreed to doing like, like X amount of stories in one post and the day rate but you know hotel and shit I was gassed back then get, having a hotel booked for me in transport I was just like 
my name when I walk in was on the little iPad. All that stuff. I was so so gassed, and I I went above and beyond, and I made sure I, I made sure I met who was responsible for booking me. I made sure I showed gratitude to every single person there, um, and then just from showing so much gratitude and going above and beyond with the posts and the stories and showing it like like it is a big deal for me. I'm not I'm never gonna act like this is normal, and then from there it was just like they I was the most booked model for them that year, and then being the most booked model for them. It just went, it started snowballing. And then, like, another big company was like, all right, Sean, we want to send you this out. How much would it be for, like, four posts? In my head, I'm like, bro, I've been wanting to shoot for you from before I even started modeling. I used to buy your shit in the shops. But I'm like, let me just say this quote. Boom, done it. But my quality of content is sick all the time with the marketing shit again and again. So I'm just like, I have to do this and that. And then PRs that I used to message that tried charging me in the past when I was coming up, now they're messaging me like, oh, I want to represent you. And then sometimes I just message me like, should be saying, like, um, do you want to go to this event? In my head, I would do it completely for free. Like, of course, I want to watch that artist in VIP. And then they add a fee on top of it, like, you're getting paid. And I'm like, what? I'm getting paid that much just to go there? I'm like, of course. Like, four stories, yeah, calm. And then from that, bro, it's just like, you. Just, it, it becomes like you, everything just starts snowballing. And then, then you're not chasing the money, you're not chasing the shoots. And because you're not chasing it, it starts coming to you. And it's just like, I don't know. And then I kind of, within... Two years of that break, I achieved all the shit I wrote down, including the billboard, which for me was like the biggest thing because when I manifest here, I used certain songs. So I had already, six years prior to me being on that billboard, I already knew what song was going to be playing in the video. I already knew who was going to be there. And I already knew like the angles was going to do the promo video for me, watching it for the first time. Because coming up, like in all the cars I drove, I had no radios and stuff. So I'd just drive and I'd manifest and manifest and manifest to, to the point where I'd be like, well, I've been driving an hour, my hands all sweaty, but I've been living in that moment that I've lived now. And it's like, it's a mad feeling, bro. And then doing that, I was just like, yeah, what's next? I've, I've, I've set out and done what I want to do in modeling. Like, what's next? And then that's how, like, natural progression into the acting, which I'd been working on prior. But, yeah. Just before we get into the acting, um, how important is manifestation? Because I feel like this, a lot of, some people still don't believe in it. Um, really? Yeah, some people still don't believe in it. They think, oh, you can't you can't visualise something and make it happen. Oh, I crazy. think as we grow now, more and more people are, are open to it. But um just explain the power of manifestation in through your eyes. It's mad yeah, you did ask that because the word manifestation, yeah, like I never knew the definition of that until I was older. And even in stuff like um uh, mood boards and um, things like that. I didn't. I didn't know they had this terminology. And when people, when the secret first came out, and everyone was like, "Have you ever seen this?" Every time I speak to people in groups, they're like, "You've read the secret in it." Did and that. I'm like, "No, nah, but I just lived it my whole life." When I was younger, like in my bunk bed above my my um, bunk was just pictures of basketball players that I wanted to look like, that I wanted to be like. That I, wanted, I did it. Then it was like, it's just so. It's just such a part of my um, every day, like. I get excited if I've got a drive so I can just think about something till it becomes real. And it's just happened time and time and time and time again in my life where it's unexplainable, like, what, what's happened and it's really... But it's it's crazy because now, like, when I manifest stuff, like, I've got videos of me um, from them six years ago and I'm speaking to the camera, yeah? And I'm like, yo, Sean, by the time you watch this, you're going to have your back tattooed. You're going to... Like, I was name shit with my physique that I've done now. You're going to do X, Y, and Z. And I'll list off the situation I'm in then. I'm like, right now, you've got, you're in debt this much. You've got this one outside. You've got this and that. And then, but by the time you watch this, bro, you're going to have X, Y, Z. And I've got all the shit that I've said back then. And it's weird because I can, like, I've, I'm saving this for the Netflix special in the future so I can put the future... You know, like how Kanye's got that documentary. So I feel like I'm going to save all the content that I want to put out then. But I've got my whole journey documented. So... I like how you say that, like it's not even a question. Yeah, of course. You, you know, you, you already know where you're going and what you're going to do. Yeah, yeah, 100%. Um, let's talk about getting into acting then and, and how that came about because I know that you, you didn't start out as an actor. That was something that happened for you later on. So let's get into that. Yeah, so I feel like it's a natural progression with, um, with the modelling side of things because like, I'm, I'm, what the directors and um, producers have complimented me on so far my acting career isn't like so much like my delivery or like anything in particular, but they always comment on my, what do they call it? It's like your awareness of where the camera is and your angles and stuff, which comes naturally from modeling in it. So it's like, and I can do the behind the camera stuff as well. I do the production stuff. So it's kind of like it just all aligned perfectly. And the thing that I love about acting is there's no time limit on it. Whereas in modeling, I felt a lot of pressure because now I'm 30. I was like, I started when I was 24, yeah, 24 trying. And then, 
I was aware by the time I hit 33, 34, I'm, I'll probably have to um, think about other stuff in it, it's like put stuff into place. But acting is forever. I can always play a role as like a dad. Well, I probably won't get casted as a dad, but I can always play a role as someone like an older person or this and that. So it was just something that I wanted. And then there was one particular thing that made me fall in love with it. Um, that's all it takes for me, right? Like, as soon as I fall in love with something, I have to go and like, I have to just pursue it and be the try and be the best at it. So like I got casted, luckily, so lucky, bro. Like um, based on my appearance via Facebook, um, they needed someone that looks like me with my heritage and stuff for a particular role, and I auditioned for it. And like when I look back, yeah, my self tape was so shit. Because now like I'm aware, like now that I've gone up in the ranks and I'm aware, you have to do like a certain color backdrop, a certain framing, your eye line's got to be this, the quality of the blah, blah, blah. Back then I just set it up and I, I cut it myself and I did this mad audition and edited it as well, we're not supposed to. Um, and they gave me like three chances because I kept fucking up with my auditions. They invited me to in-person one and I just carried, I carried myself the way I carry myself and they were like, I'm gonna lie, it's your energy that's getting you this role and the way you're hungry and stuff. And I let them know like, bro, I'm, I'm, I don't come off here school background, I'm willing to learn, tell me anything, I'll be here, like everything, blah, blah, blah. And then, yeah, from there, I just got that role, which it was like, I think I had six days filming all together. And like some of them were like overnight ones, which is sick. And I had one day where we had a scene in the morning and a scene in the evening. So in between was my own time. So it was like, do your thing. And I remember like, I was like, I left set after my first scene. Um, I found a gym in the local area in my script. And I just did sets in between. Um, I was learning my lines and people come up to me and ask me like what I'm doing here. And I'm like, oh, you know, I'm an actor. I'm saying it on my chest because I was on set. And uh, the feeling I got from it was just like, yeah, I want this next. I want this. So then the the fire and the passion for the modeling kind of went out a little bit. But I'm still forever eternally grateful because now I get to like... Because with the modeling side of things, yeah, it gives you so much freedom. Like, I can hold out a brand now and be like, I'm, I'm flying out next week. Do you want this many posts for this many shoots? And would get this many items? And they can be like, yeah. And then, then I can just be away for a week and have like make memories and this and that but it's like there's no it's not longevity so like and I've done it for like how many years now so I'm like yeah acting's what I'm putting my heart and soul into next um so yeah and then again with the modeling as well like I can do a lot of shit behind the scenes I can work on my look I can reach out to brands I can reach did all this stuff but the acting side of things it's like because that's go for your agent and stuff if you want to look like your high demand and stuff like there's only so much shit I can do behind the scenes so it's, it's nice to have it as a back burner career forever and now I'm, I've done everything I need to do with being on the right platforms, having an agent and everything like that. And it's mad, bro, like, to think I don't come from an acting background and within the space, the small amount of space that I've been pursuing it, like, I'm on... got a kiss of scene on Netflix coming out in April. I attended my first premiere of myself, like, in a, in a cinema show in, which is sick. I've seen myself cinema twice now. Um, bare music videos, bare, like, just mad opportunities all the time, all through this this stuff that I've been pursuing so it's like I don't know man I just love I just love this shit man talk to us about some of the things that you've starred in uh, the films and the music videos so you know I've got to give a big shout out to Deep Green because he was the first person that gave me a chance and his manager Dis Distinct Five I forgot to say his name on Instagram but he like I reached out to them and do you know how I found him was like at the time I was working in schools with all these little hood youths and they were just they was all banging his music and they're like Obviously, I was, I was honest with these kids. I was like, yeah, I'm pursuing this at the same time. They're like, oh, you need to message this guy. You need to message this guy. So I messaged him. I was like, bro, like, any opportunity, please. Like, I would love to have the chance to act in your video. And then he was like, speak to my manager. My, his manager put me on and then like used that to apply for another one, another one, another one. So that was my first one with, with Deep, which is sick, man. And then like I did stuff with like, Smoke Perp in America. That was, he was, I think he was big at the time. And then since then, I've done um, that Wes Nelson that KSI and there's a few uh, wait there's music video wise there's a few but I've done my first feature film was Boy in the Corner which is sick which is out on Amazon Prime um, Sky Cinema and some other ones which I remember probably most of them yeah 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 <laughs> and then that, that's, that's my first main role in a movie and then I've got a sick story about The Informer actually which is like my first bit of recognition I got I got like seven seconds screen time yeah in a cinema but it was my first like Thing, but I was the cover photo for the international trailer and it was like a really big film. So that's what I get most, not most, but like majority of the DMs I was getting through that and shit would be through that. If someone's like, yo, bro, have you seen it? I just, they take pictures of it and send it to me. It's sick. But like, imagine I got on set, yeah, I got casted as a um, Hispanic basketball player. Um, and then 
because my basketball background, the beginning of the scene, I was allowed to be the one that starts with the ball. So the, the first thing I did was fuck up straight away. I got there and I got the wrong tattoos on me because they, they do fake tattoos. I got the tattoos of Latin King instead of Hispanic one. And I was like, fuck. The first scene that I was a part of, we had to walk into the courtyard. All like the people acting as neo-Nazis or white supremacists, but I go one way and all like the black and Spanish go the other. And I was trying to be a bad man in character looking down. I looked up, I walked to the wrong side. I was, in a, I was with all the white people. I was like, fuck. Maybe I shouldn't have done it. So I was like, I fucked up twice already. And then the main scene was like the main actual Hollywood actors walk around the um the the prison yard thing when we were playing basketball. But like each time they they, they read set, it takes like 10, 15 minutes because there's so many people to manage and mics and blah, blah, blah. Get me? So I was like, we'd fuck about with the ball. But every time the people looked over, it was always me that was fucking about. They gave me like two, three warnings. And they were like, you know what, Sean, you're not in this scene anymore. So I was like, oh, bro, I fucked up. I lot, I'm, I'm out of the opportunity. And then they were like, and then Common, you know, the rapper Common came on set. And I was like, what are you saying, Common, one-on-one? -on -one? And I had the ball in my hand. He was like, yeah, let's go. So we started playing ball. And obviously he didn't know that I used to play that level I played at. So I beat him in like a really sick way. Like in basketball, if you're, if you're tied up and it's win by two, you shoot a three, you win. So I shot a three, I turned around and celebrated before it went in. By this time, everyone was watching the directors, the producers, the assistant directors, the aide, everyone was watching us play. And then afterwards, he was like, Sean, do you reckon you could do a drug deal whilst playing basketball? And I was like, yeah, of course. I was just shocked that the director knew my name. So then went from there and I did the drug deal. I did, added a little scene in just there and then. And then that made that scene made the thing. So it was sick, man. Like little things like that, like, but constant. Like I'm just constantly grafting, man. It's very evident that um, you're very passionate about acting and, and that's what you want to do in the future. Yeah. What's the top three things you love about being an actor? Top three things would be... I love the I love the I love seeing um on the back of the camera what it looks like and the creative process. So yeah, the creative process would be the first one. The second one is getting having a character yeah that they 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 make you get lost in. But it's so mad because I don't I'm I'm still learning about it. But that American one I did the other day, the um supporting role I did, my, that's like the biggest thing I've done so far. I had a small part in it where I was playing um one of the main Hollywood actors like gang members outside the house. And I had like maybe like five or six lines, but the director took me to one side and he broke down my character for 10 minutes and he taught me so much. Because I was like, my scene was like asking for money, telling someone to do one, blah, blah, blah. And I, when I rehearsed, I was like all mad, like telling people to do this, this and that. And he was like, bro, like, think about it. Your character, you could kill this guy in a second. Like, why would you do that? He's like, face every way, lean back. Don't even acknowledge him. When you ask for the money, just do... That thing. I was like, bro, and then he, he gave me so much belief I was this character that when I came on to doing it, I smashed it. And then luckily everyone gave me really good feedback as well. So that's the the one thing. And then the third thing would be the perception that um, this might be quite egotistical. But I think it's because I've done so much extra work. And I'll still do extra work if it's necessary. Or I've done so many like supporting roles and all like that. When you go on set as a main actor or like a speaking role, it's like you go through a different door. They put you in a different waiting area. They just They just treat you so differently. And it's like the perception that they have of you. And I'm there telling all of them, like, on that big one I did the other day, it was someone's job to hold my coat in between takes. And you know, me coming from nothing, like, I'm like, well, I hold my own coat, you know, you don't have to hold it for me. And they're like, no, no, that's what I'm here for. Just stand there holding the coat. I finish my scene, they put the coat back on me. I'm like, bro, this is crazy. This is so mad. Asking me to come into, like, my, my, my room, like, a room with my name on it and asking me, like, do you need any candles in here? I'm like, what the fuck do I need candles for? But, like, yeah. <laughs> so, uh... Being an actor and a model, you must do okay with the women. Yeah. What's your views on Andrew Tate? So, with um, this whole Andrew Tate movement, I will say that he has massively inspired me and a lot of my group of friends um, to, to be better. And I know that's quite a controversial thing to say because of some stuff that's been released, but the message that he's portraying in regards to um, progression in business, in, in regards to being like a military aged male, 18 to 35, being at the forefront of society and stuff. And the pressures it is to be a high value man and for someone to articulate it and put it in a way where I couldn't, I always felt it, but I didn't know how to say it. Um, I think it's been massively beneficial. And I do, I do support the, um, the, I support that in order to be a high value male, you need to be doing X, Y, and Z. And, um, and I think that's, I don't think that's a bad message to send. I think if, if all of us were set, if someone said to all the young men, like, if you want to be high value, you need to be going to gym, you need to be able to protect your woman, you need to be able to 
be financially secure. You need to like you're competing with these other men. So if you have that mindset, you're you're gonna be better. I, I feel that anyway, and I don't think it's a bad message to to send. Do you think uh, Andrew Tate's made it acceptable for males to feel this way? Yeah, hundred percent. And I feel like for anyone that does have like an issue with um, what he says and what he preaches and stuff, I feel like if you just do more research and listen to the full, the long, the long version of the content, it's it's the reassurance, man. Like, because we've been feeling this way. We've, like, for me, I, I've always respected women so much, and it's always been a massive part of my life. Like, if you've seen the relationship I got with my mum, it's incredible. Like, we've, I, I've never, never done anything bad towards my mum. She says jump, I say how high. My one of my best friends in the whole world, my housemate. She's um, a female. She's a feminist. My every partner that I've had, if you like, check my history. If anyone has ever seen this at home, like you, you see that I put them on a pedestal. And for this, this in this day and age now, like so much shit has been called um, toxic masculinity or like things like that. And I'm like, I, I don't think it's the case. Like I don't think us men being men isn't. It's it's kind of like being pushed down. It makes you feel bad for having these thoughts when it shouldn't be the case. It's like a thing that it reconfirmed for me, yeah, is um, gender roles. Because before, like, if you mentioned gender roles, I would have just been like, your next subject. I don't want to speak about this. But now it's like, I think it's okay to have gender roles. Like, I feel like if someone broke into my house in the middle of the night, I'm going to be the one that protects my girl. However, like, if if I've got a um, a baby and I want it to be nurtured and stuff, like, I don't believe that. I feel like women have a natural, naturally better at being nurturing, being understanding, being empathetic, having patience. I feel like naturally it comes to them more. So I don't think there's anything wrong with that. And I feel like it's just more so in the Western society where we're, we're told, like, like, the women in Western society are told X, Y, and Z. Whereas if you ask my mum, like, for example, like, what do you want for Sean's perfect partner? She'd be like, she needs to be nurturing, she needs to be loving, she needs to be able to, like, cook and, provo- like, sort your family out. She needs, like, imagine saying that to, like, um, a Western girl. And they'll be like, oh, no, I don't want to do that. I want to, like, do X, Y, Z and this and that. I'm like... Ah oh, man, I don't know. It's difficult. It's a it's a, it's a really hard like um, thing to to balance and talk about without offending people. Another thing Andrew Tate believes is that the man should go to work and provide. Yeah. And the woman should be at home cooking, cleaning, yeah. looking after children. What's your take on that? See, this is like I don't think there's anything wrong with that mindset if the woman wants to do it as well. And it's like, at the end of the day, every relationship is an energy exchange, right? So it's like. Even if you've got brethrens that aren't on job and successful and stuff, if they can make you laugh, that's your exchange, that you're around them, they give you like good endorphins, you make you happy. So in a partnership as well, if, you, if your wife, if she happens to be um, better at cooking, better at nurturing and all that stuff, then yeah, that's calm, she can do that. But if, I wouldn't, I wouldn't force it on a girl, I wouldn't be like, I wouldn't get with her and be like, you have to stay at home. I don't want, I don't want her to ever be unhappy. And I think where my opinion differs from Andrew Tate and from other people with them views is, but when, when if I've got a wife here yeah, or a partner, I want her with me all the time, which isn't something that they say. I would like, yeah, I wouldn't want her doing anything mad, but I would want her like, because my lifestyle's crazy, so it'd be nice to have my partner with me all the time and have like a nurturing, loving, that just wants the best for me and truly wants the best for me in her heart and being empathetic and understanding. Because sometimes I feel a lot of times with um, girls, like the ones that are really, really like down for you, they understand you more than you know yourself sometimes. And sometimes like as men, we don't know how to articulate how we feel. We just feel a certain emotion. And for that person to like talk it through with you and explain to you why you think, why they think you feel the way you feel because they know you so well and be able to be there for you, it would be like, I feel like that person's so much more um, beneficial than to have someone that's just, you know, like just stuck at home. So what are your thoughts on your partner or females doing OnlyFans or porn? So I wouldn't I wouldn't be with anyone that's done OnlyFans in the past or done porn like done porn in the past. Um and I think that's just for obvious reasons, because who wants who really wants to see their wife getting clarted by a next man? Or who wants to see their wife just do you know what I mean? And having that footage out there forever, that's crazy. Like, you think when I have children, they can ever see things out of their mum? Like, nah. Like, I've never sent a dick pic in my life. And it's not like I'm I'm asking something for my partner that I wouldn't do. You know I mean? I'm just very conscious of where I'm going in my future and there's never going to be anything that leaks that's like, like that. And my partner can't have that risk either. If you could craft your perfect partner, what would be involved? My perfect partner would be um, nurturing, loving, empathetic, 
understanding, can cook. That's just not, not a misogynistic way, I just can't cook myself. Um, and cultured, respectful, good morals. Um, and then, what else is there? Yeah, that's it. And just the understanding, I just, it's the understanding for me, bro. Like, I just need my girl to just understand. Do you know what I mean? I don't know, it's not like I have an issue finding people like this, but I mean, um, that like truly, truly to your core understands you. Yeah, that's, I think that's it. A bit of a weird question. But when was you genuinely the happiest in your life? Um, when I was in love, you know, when I was in love, um, it wasn't even that long ago. Like I, uh, I probably, I recently got back with an ex, and then it was the first time in my life where like I'd been in. I've only been in love with one person in it, so that's the one person. I got back with her, um, and then I went to we went on a holiday together. And back in England, I had everything in check: my finances in check, my bookings coming in left, right, and center. Um, my social media was growing at a rate it's never grown before. Like everything was just perfect. And on top of that, I had the person back that I was in love with and I hadn't felt that feeling in so long. And I just remember like just being in complete bliss for a week. It was just like un unreal. Um, but apart from that, yeah, nah. Apart from that, like it's just when I set like a mad, mad, mad unrealistic goal and take years to doing it. And that day that I, that day that I achieved that, I get happiness. But then the next day I'm back on it. Now I might, I might reward myself for like two days off and then I'll just get back on it. How important do you think freedom of speech is? Yeah, I feel like freedom of speech is definitely, um, what's the word? Let me start this one again. Freedom of speech. I don't know what this. Yeah, I feel like freedom of speech is, is important because it's like, if you don't want to see it, if you don't want to hear it, just turn it off. Like, And if their views don't match your views, then that's fine. And from when you silence the other person, you're only pushing one narrative and then automatically this side's going to push back. And then might it, you might push back further than you would have if they didn't if they didn't silence you, you know. So Sean, we know you're a very ambitious person. Um, you would probably describe yourself as a workaholic. Yeah, I would describe you as a workaholic. <laughs> yeah. uh, but what brings you peace? That's a really good question. You know, um, I'm still I'm still trying to figure that out because I've got a life coach, um, and he recently told me because I, I I used to go to him all the time on my way up. Um, and he used to tell me about the importance of finding peace and stuff. And I always found my peace with the girl. So like when I'm single, if I'd been grafting all week with doing shoots and everything and just pursuing greatness, but like, it's not like it's, when I say grafting, yeah, it's like, yeah, you work, you, the actual photo shoot's fun. That's the fun part in it. And then it's like afterwards, but it's the pressure of like the pressure I put myself under and what I want to achieve, how much I want to earn physical, like what I want to look like, everything like this. Yeah. So it's like, at the end of the week, I might reward myself with two, three hours where I'd, I'd, I'd hold out a chick that, I've, that I'm cool with, that understands me, that's not talking about the understanding thing. Um, and we'll spend the night together. And that's the one time where I'll sleep good because I'd feel safe with this one particular person or whichever particular person it is at the time. And, you know, like, you can just lay with them and they can tickle your back and you can fall asleep watching something. You feel good. And then that's when I found peace. And then as I became more successful in my career, um, I went back to see my life coach again. And I, I, I went to go speak to him about progression and will I ever be content and what's next for me and this and that. But he kept talking to me about me and peace. And he basically told me that I can't find peace within a girl, an external thing. He's like, because if you always rely on that, then you're never going to be truly at peace and happy of yourself. And I was like, I didn't come here for a lesson, man. I came here for like, what's next to make money. But when he said that, so that's kind of, that would happen kind of recently. So I need to I need to work on that man that finding peace and I feel like a big part of it is going back to the Philippines for me I've been for 10 years so like I said to you before we started filming like I've literally just booked to go back next month so I hope by going home and putting things into place because it's a question I ask myself often like will I ever be at peace will I ever be content but then I compare myself to like and it might sound humorous to some people but like The Rock, Kevin Hart, Chris Brown all these people that are so more, more talented and they can retire right now and be millionaires forever but why do they keep going? I feel like I'm cut from that same cloth. And also asking and reflecting and asking myself, like, do you think I'm being pushed towards success for a fear of ending up from like where I came from? Or do you think I'm being pulled by achieving greatness? And it's just like, you know that self-analysis and asking myself these questions all the time. So I'm still trying to learn um, what my piece would be and how to achieve it and if I'm going to be content. It's hard to know. 
Do you fear the day that you stop? Do I fear it? Nah. I have a different mindset. I think like this whole thing about being retiring at 65 and working your whole life, like, I don't want to retire. I love what I do. I don't really go to work. I love what I do. So, yeah, I don't think, I don't know if I'll stop. I think maybe from what I gather from my, my close friends that have had children, maybe having a children might change my perception and stuff. Um, but until then, nah, I'm just going to be pursuing greatness. Going back to females, just for a minute. How much have females been a distraction in your life? Yeah, so this is a big thing for me, like especially coming up, like like I said, I didn't grow up on road, I didn't grow up in the hood, I didn't grow up like gang affiliate, nothing like that. My only things was girls. Like that's always been my biggest strength, my biggest weakness. And I've always had the same um role, if you know what I mean, like of any group of friends. Like I'm the one that the girl the friends' girlfriends don't want them going out with if they're single type person. I'm the one that's just like when I was younger, they just call me player. When you get older, it's like fuck boy. Then it's yeah, less. Then it's like whatever it is, whatever it is. But it's just like they they were a massive distraction, and I had to go through a lot at a younger age. That's why I'm so glad I didn't find success until later. At this age, I'm at now, and the mindset I've got now. Because if I would have if I would have been in the position I'm in now, like years ago, I would have got distracted by girls so much more. Like I was getting distracted. But yeah, it, it, it's difficult, man. Like. And there's no, it's mad because when you're, when you're coming up as well, there's no one that you can look up to that gives you solid advice about don't get, don't get caught up with girls, don't do this. And until now, and there's people like Andrew Tate and people like um, Jordan Peterson, there's people like this thing that give you the, a different mindset towards it all. How did you stop getting distracted by females? How I stopped getting distracted by females, if I'm completely honest, it was um, through therapy. Um, and... Basically, there was just one lady out of all the people that I came in contact with on my, along my journeys, this one older lady that just cut through all of my cheeky, like, happy, that like, bullshit stuff. And then she was just like, Sean, you could end up with a baby mom, you could end up with AIDS, you could end up with da da all this stuff. And I was like, I want to stop. Like, I don't want to be like this. At the time, I was doing club promoting, modelling stuff, just started popping. I did a few, like, reality appearance, whatever. And then... I was just like, you know, society it takes so much that if you're the guy that can get girls, you should be getting girls. The amount of times I was outside, like, I walked up to a club and I was like, I don't really want to be here right now. But my brethren's were like, oh, nah, fam, like, da-da-da-da-da. Look at that girl, she's on you, like, this and that. And then you feel like a pussy for not doing it. And it's a young boy's mindset. And then when I got out of that mindset, um, that's why I feel like boys chase, men attract. And that that was the biggest shift for me when I stopped chasing. And, yeah, just... You don't need it. You don't need it. And people can tell your energy is so different. Like when you walk in the club, I'm not like looking to try and this and that. I just, I'm there. And then they just come. No, it's different now. But what's been us? Yeah, it's all right, man. It's all right. My friends love it. <laughs> My friends know it's more than I do. An interesting question. Do you think it's easier for females to cheat? Mm. Yeah, 100%. Yeah, 100% easier for females to, to cheat because the majority of um, girls could, like, walk down the road right now and just stand there and be like, who wants to me? And they would be able to get it easy in it. Whereas, like, the majority of men, if they did that, it's not going to happen. And, yeah. So I think it's easier for girls to actually feel like to do the to do the, to do it. But I think mentally it would probably be easier for a man to cheat because they'll, they'll be able to differentiate between feelings and just, like, be in. Um, but yeah, I'm in no way, shape or form an advocate for cheating. Like, I'll, I'll, if I'm with someone, I'm with them and yeah, and they're, they're, they're an extension of me. I'm an extension of them. And another thing that I've said, yeah, in front of like a feminist before, um, which kind of triggered them, like this whole belonging to your partner. Like if I'm with someone, yeah, she's mine and I'm hers and we're an extension of each other. She belongs to me. I belong to her. And the way I carry myself when I'm in a relationship, even if I'm in a club, yeah, and a girl's trying to chat to my ear, I don't even do this anymore because I'm thinking, like, one picture taken, that could offend my girl. You get me? Like, that, that could be, like, this in that short, in this this person's man. And he's, like, even if it's not the case. So I carry myself, when I'm in a relationship, relationship, I carry myself so well. Like, when I get messages come through, I don't, I won't ever reply to them. I won't ever, like, like them or show a little bit of anything. I'm just very conscious of all of it. And, yeah, so when I'm with someone, I'm with them. Just before we finish up, give us a quote that you live by. Um, if you entertain a clown, you become part of the circus. That's when that's my philosophy towards um, haters or anyone that I don't even entertain conversations with people that that like. If someone said to me, "Be realistic," right now, I wouldn't even. 
indulge in the conversation. Like I don't, yeah, I don't want to become part of any circus. Um, obviously, hard work beats talent, and talent fails to work hard. That was just through basketball, um, and that was just my mindset towards anything. I might not be the most talented actor, but there's no one that's going to outwork me in it. Um, if you never enjoy the sunshine, no, you'll never enjoy the sunshine if you always worry about the storm or something like that. And I feel like that's you know perspective towards people being negative. And when I say I'm going to do something, I don't worry about the the things that could go wrong. I don't have any concerns of this stuff, which when I speak to other people, it's like they have a, they get scared of failing. Like my perspective towards L was like, nah, man, that's not a loss, that's a lesson. And I think the final one would just be, what I just said, boys, boys chase, men attract. And that's something I've just recently learned. Thank you for your time today. No, thank you, bro. That was a very interesting <laughs> conversation and uh, we might have upset a few people there. Yeah. They're... But just remember, everyone has an opinion. Yeah. Um, just before we finish up, what motivates you? What keeps you going? Motivates me is achieving all the goals I set out um, and retiring my family. And my biggest motivation at the moment is becoming a millionaire, which for anyone at home that's watching, like, I don't know, for me, it was it was me turning thirty. There was just a massive shift in my energy, and now it's like you get you the way you value the way you view money. You get a money blueprint from your family, right? Like from when you're growing up and how it's spoke about in your home and this and that. Because I come from a broke background, it's like money was so toxic all the time. But now it's like nah, the way I'm looking at it is it, the way it flows. Again, Andrew Tate thing. He's talking about water. He's talking about look at money as um, it's not figures on a screen. It's like um, it's like a liquid. So it comes from the rain, hits the floor, goes down the river, goes into the sea, blah, 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 and it gets evaporated back up. And it's like this, find a way to stand in the way and having money conversations. So at the moment, like me and my friends will sit together like, and we'll just, like me, mainly me and my business partner, so we launched a company recently and we'll literally just be like, every, just breaking down every single thing and how we can utilize every minute of the day to get to the next thing. And then I'm going to retire my mom, retire my, um, my, my dad's retired anyway, a bit rut. And then just um, do it that way. But like, it's it's an, it's incredible. And I know my mom is so. Now that I've prioritised the money stuff, she's she's really happy. Um, especially our, our bus study the other day as well. So yeah, she, she's really happy right now. <laughs> Plug your company before we leave. So yeah, so we've got um, a media company called Dream Our Media, and yeah, other than that, Instagram Sean Player, TikTok Sean Player show, and YouTube's the next big thing. By the time this is out, I would have revamped my YouTube channel. Hope anyway, I'm doing it next week. So if it's oh yeah, my YouTube channel should be up and running properly. And then, yeah, and then just keep following for all the updates because I'll be doing products soon, items, everything. So, yeah, man. We'll leave every single one of your links in the description of this video. So Thank anyone you. that wants to get in contact with Sean, anyone wants to book Sean for modelling or acting, uh, you can go ahead and, and find his social media and his media company links below. You've been listening to Insight with the Podcast Club and that was Sean Pileo. Thank you for your time today. Now, thank you, bro. Sick. <laughs>